Welcome back to the Muzzle Blast Podcast, the official podcast of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. This week we have a special episode um, with the COVID-19 cancellation of the 2020 June Nationals here. At the NMLRA, we had a couple people reach out and share some memories of the June Nationals with us. And this one came by way of a few phone calls. Um, first, the calls had gone out to a couple of the board of directors and then it got around to us here in the office and, and the Muzzle Blast staff. And the, the caller was Tom Grant. And Tom, you'll, you'll hear about Tom in this story. But 50 years ago, Tom and a few buddies took a canoe and traveled from Pennsylvania to Friendship, Indiana, via the Ohio River. And as we're recording, it's the 50th anniversary of this trek. And Tom just wanted to reach out and see if anybody remembered and, and share his story with us. In October 1970, an article was written by Max Vickery recounting the tale of this adventure. The, the three guys, Tom Grant, Ed Kenny, and Gordon Bird, shared their story with Max Vickery, and Max put it then into Muzzle Blast. So part of what you're going to hear is the reading of the Max Vickery article, but then we've also got a little bit of a conversation I had with Tom Grant about the trek and the adventure. This is one of the best parts of this job, uh, being able to listen to and hear about these stories. I mean, I don't know what young person that's interested in muzzleloading and living history wouldn't want to just jump in a canoe and live on live on their canoe and, and in the woods for a few days, especially right now with kind of the, with all the chaos going around in the world. So. Sit back, relax. This will be a little bit of a different one, but um, thanks for listening. Fifteen years ago today, fifty. You're not that good. Fifty <laughs> years ago today, uh, May fifteenth, nineteen seventy. Me and two other guys arrived at the range uh, on Lawfrey Creek uh, by canoe. Wow! And we had started on April thirtieth in Pittsburgh on the Monongahela and went 525 miles down the Ohio River and 25 miles up Wofford Creek, pulling a good part of the way up Wofford. Oh, That's I can imagine. Spot. And uh, we landed just south of the bridge on the primitive range side of the creek during the spring shoot. Wow. So what prompted you and, guys uh, to, to try something like that? Well, we were, we were just talking, and, and we thought, you know, boy, they used to go down the Ohio River all the time, and it was actually uh, Ed Kenny, uh, who was a member. Uh, his, he's passed away a number of years ago. His last name was spelled K-E-N-E-Y. It was his idea, and I said I'd go along. I was a young man. Um, and uh, we uh, he took along a, a young guy he knew, and uh, we went. 525 miles down the river it took us about 15 days we had a did a Hudson Bay start from Pittsburgh left left in the late afternoon and then arrived on the 15th uh, in friendship wow and uh, there was a uh, article actually Max Vickery wrote an article telling our story it was in the October 1970 issue of Muzzle Blasts. Okay. And there's some pictures in there. I'm the guy on the left. <laughs> to the Range Away, You Rolling River. Written by Max Vickery. Published in Muzzle Blasts, October 1970. The following is an actual account of three men, Ed Kenny, Tom Grant, and Gordon Bird, who set out from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in an 18-foot canoe and paddled 525 miles in 15 days to the Walter Klein Range at Friendship, Indiana. A feat of endurance, determination, hardships, and not excluding the heartbreak of loss of equipment. As you follow along with these men, part in narrative, part in daily entries from their diary, you will see they still have the fiber of the frontiersmen who opened this country. The inception of this idea came about while talking around a fire on Pine Tree Row during the spring shoot of 1969 with a group of men from Illinois and Ohio. The conversation developed as to how it would be to travel on the Ohio River years ago. To throw yourselves back 200 years for 15 days is not the same as an afternoon in the woods picking mushrooms. As the conversation unfolded, the will to do this became more intense 
sent to the place it had to be done. Ed Kenny crewed up with Tom Grant and Gordon Bird at the Illinois Rendezvous and the die was cast. Many trips were needed to outfit the voyage and discussions on what to take, weight limits, and more. At 6 p.m. on April 30th, 1970, they said their goodbyes and accepted the good wishes of those on shore and pushed the nose of their canoe into the Monongahela above Fort Pitt. The men made a Hudson Bay start. By this I mean they left late in the day, so if something was needed at the first night camp, the distance would not be too great to return for it. In the first few miles of the trip, they passed under a series of stacked clover-leaved superhighways, noise and cars streaming as ants carrying sugar to a nest. Those they passed afloat aboard their 40-foot Richardson and Matthew cruisers noticed their four inches of freeboard, refreshed their martinis, and felt very secure five feet above the water. Diary entry, April 30th. Made it to Emsworth Dock on the Ohio before dark. Camped above the locks. Was informed to our surprise that we were allowed to pass through the locks regardless of the size of our craft. We were happy to hear that we would not have a, to portage past 38 locks time being important to make the range by shoot time. This camp was warm and comfortable. May 1st. Started the day passing through above the lock, now moving away from industry complex, country becoming pleasant, seeing all sorts of game, muskrat, groundhog, ducks of all kinds, geese, heron, and deer. Encountered heavy headwinds, waves running two feet high, made a 28-mile day, Camped at dust on the mouth of the Beaver Creek. Good supper of beef stew and tea. Must maintain personal hygiene as much as possible. What did you do for food along the way? Well, we 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 took some food with us, but mostly we just stopped at Riverside. Okay. Joints uh -huh. and uh, you know, it was funny. I noticed after being out in the weather for a week or so, you'd. We'd go into these restaurants or whatever, or cafes, and it was, uh, it seemed your skin would burn because it would seem so warm in there. You know? Yeah. It probably was. But, uh, we survived, and uh, I remember uh, one time we uh, we pulled into some town, I don't even remember where it was, and uh, went up and there was a cafe, and uh, we went in, and uh, Ed got a $100 bill change, which was probably old lady came out of the back she was the owner and she came out of the back turned around pulled her skirt up and pulled a wad big enough to choke a horse out of her stocking and <laughs> peeled off the 20s <laughs> to change for a hundred dollars <laughs> we were going to go to the bank but i said to ed that we're probably first person that looked like this since the river pirates hit the town so we should probably not go in the bank may 2nd Made breakfast and broke camp at 8.30 a.m. Started to sprinkle and spent the rest of the day in hard rain. Ate dried fruit along the way. I, Ed Kenny, sit astern, Gordon in the middle with the longest blade, Tom in the nose. We've passed East Liverpool and Steubensville. Needed ponchos all this day. Camped in a park in Wellsburg, West Virginia, crossed from Mingo Junction. Met some young men interested in our trip. We were informed by them that one member of the Lewis and Clark expedition is buried here. May 3rd. Damp, but no rain. Fog and mist. We've passed Wheeling, West Virginia. Laid into Moundsville, West Virginia. Bought food, beans, cigars, dried fruit, tobacco. All the items were covered with dust. Floated down from here. Getting dark fast. No suitable camp in sight. Camped at Dilly's Bottom, a mud flat. This night we slept on a hillside, rigged our lean-tos, and built a fire. Cold, very cold and damp. Men trembling with cold. Dropped below 30 degrees with frost. Diary entry May 5th. Ramrods swelled in furls from a constant dampness. Laid rifles to top, belly up to catch wind and sun for drying. Passed Ben's Run, West Virginia. In making Bend and River to the right, we angled for the far shore to cut the distance. Now heavy in headwind, with waves running two feet high and building, taking solid water over the prow. Here, canoe swamped under us. We were in water 55 feet deep and one quarter mile from either shore. Keel up with waves breaking over us. Lost much equipment. One of the things in the article he mentioned, we at one point we swamped in the river. We were trying to cut corners across the wide spot. Uh -huh. And the wind wind picked up and the water came over the bow of the canoe and filled it up with water and oh. we swamped. Our survival now most important. 
holding a canoe drifting downstream a mile, this taking an hour before we, w- we were able to beach. A list of the gear that was lost. Two Art Howley rifles, pouches and horns. Two tomahawks. Two hunting shirts. Two pair of moccasins. Gordon's clothes. Two ponchos. Coffee pot. Tarp. Two fine WK knives. Possible's bag. Strike a light. This equipment was lost with much regret due to the value and sentiment. Had Kenny lost two Art Holly rifles. Oof. And that was mentioned in the article. And uh, my rifle I still have, as a matter of fact, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I have mine tied in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, it, it survived. But all people remembered was that we lost our rifles. Well, I like to set the record straight. I did not lose my rifle. <laughs> you still got it. I still have it. That's awesome. And uh, then uh, we, uh, but if you're going on a canoe trip, don't take a curly maple stock. Oh, <laughs> what would it's you like recommend? Yeah, walnut. <laughs> <laughs> Some dark, dark, heavy wood that doesn't soak up water. Oh, okay. That curly maple really does. And it, it, it uh, there's still a, a fine crack that is closed up on the stock where the water had spread it apart. Oh, wow. But it was still in working conditions, and that's a good thing about flintlocks. They dry out, flints dry out a lot faster than percussion. Can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's funny, when we swamp, I had a green stocking cap that I was wearing, and, like a voyeur's cap, yeah. a ditty cap, and uh, I lost it when we went in the water, and I, I I saw it floating about a mile down. The street, <laughs> no uh, way. And picked it up, and it had about five pounds of Ohio mud in it. Oh. I, I rinsed it out and, and wore it. It's actually I'm wearing the picture in the magazine. Diary entry May 8th. Stopped this day at Point Pleasant Battleground, named by Simon Kenton. Here in October 10th, 1774, General Andrew Lewis and a thousand Virginia riflemen defeated the Federated Indian tribes led by Cornstalk. Known as the first battle of the revolution, it was the most important battle between the Indians and the whites. For further information, please see page 95 of the Frontiersman book. Leaving here, we paddled till 1 a.m., making 50 miles. Camped at Cox's Landing, fell exhausted and slept. We, uh, we made it all the way down the river. We were run out of town in Martinsville, West Virginia, or New Martinsville, West Virginia. Why was that? Well, we'd stopped and, and gone up uh, into town to get some, we wanted to get some uh, meatswood oil and, and linseed oil at the hardware store uh, for our, our guns and our, our leather equipment. And uh, one of the fellows was wearing a, a sheath knife, and evidently in West Virginia, that's a big no-no. Or it was at the time, and the, the local sheriff showed up with his uh, his muscle, which has probably been playing for the high school football team a couple of years before. But uh, <laughs> they asked us to leave, so they escorted us down to the river, and we left. Well, when we got to Friendship, there were some people from a town in Ohio that were sort of right across the river from New Martinsville, and evidently they published an article in their newspaper about the young patriotic people over in New Martinsville running a set. <laughs> <laughs> May 9th. Past Huntington, West Virginia, and Ashland, Kentucky. Determined to make Portsmouth, Ohio, we worked the boat until 1.30 a.m., beached and slept. Made 57 miles this day. I, I remember one time we were going by, I think it was Portsmouth, Ohio, or Wheeling, West Virginia, or something. I think it was Portsmouth, Ohio. And it was just mile after mile of industrial wasteland. Yeah. And we had to keep going late into the night till we finally hit a place where it was woods and, you know, we could camp. May 11th, early start, warm. Camped at Ripley, Ohio due to the storm approaching. Loss of belt axe now felt as poles were needed to make shelter. May 12th, some wind, some rain. Got caught in heavy storm above New Richmond, Ohio. Visibility in this rain was at 15 feet. Rainwater was running off the banks as if it would a slate roof. Passed through the last locks. May 13th. Determined to pass Cincinnati and make Aurora. Little rain and good current. 
made Aurora by dusk and camped on Wilson Creek. The men were now passing through some very early Indiana history. Benjamin Walker came into this area from Pennsylvania in 1796. Benjamin had to travel under the name of Wilson due to the fact that he and his brother had killed two Indians in retaliation for the Indians of killing their father. Peace was made later with the pursuing Indians, and Benjamin was able to use his true name and bring his family out. On May 14, 1970, the three men left the Ohio River and entered the Lawfury Creek. The water was high enough that they were able to paddle eight to nine miles in comfort. Had they been there in the 1820s, their passing would have been just a matter of daily course. The town of Hartford was laid out by Benjamin Walker in 1817. Mr. Walker had a grist mill at this site in 1820, and there was a great deal of farming and trade at Hartford. As you pass through Hartford now on a little secondary road number 262, it is hard to picture 40 or 50 flatboats tied up to her wharfs, men chanting, and backs bent to the labors of loading the boats. Stranger still would have been what they would have seen in Milton, just a few miles further up the Lawfrey. Here, all romance of the trip ended for the three men, before they had to cordle the rest of the way, which is to pull the canoe by ropes. At Milton, first called James Mill, after the founder, John James, they would have seen a steamboat under construction named the Dolphin and this boat's run took it between Rising Sun, Indiana, and Cincinnati, Ohio. A hard thing to believe now, as they were ankle-deep in water, sliding and falling on moss-covered rocks, pulling their canoe along behind them. Diary entry May 14th. At Milton, the water level is no longer sufficient to paddle, cordoned the last 16 miles to the range. During this time, a copperhead entered the water and passed within inches of Ed and Tom, driving them into the canoe. Darkness overtook us at 9.30 p.m. Can hear firing at the range, but unable to make it due to the danger of slipping an injury on the slick rocks. A storm passed over the range that Thursday evening and hit these men, driving them to high ground for fear of a flash flood in the creek bed. They camped a mile from the range due to this storm and darkness. Soon after starting on May 15th in the morning, they made the range at 8.30 a.m., thus completing the 525-mile trip. We arrived down in Friendship, and uh, I remember pulling up along, uh, seeing the campsites along what is called Pine Tree Row there, right along the road, and saying hello to the camp. And uh, they said, where are you from? And we said, Pittsburgh. And there was a fellow there named Bill Trigger, uh -huh. a member for many years. And he says, by God, they made it. <laughs> and so we went down and we beached, uh, the, we pulled a canoe up on by the bridge there and walked into the main gate with our paddles over our shoulders. And they were announcing on the intercom that, or the speaker system that we'd come from Pittsburgh. And there's quite a bit of applause and so forth. And Oh, I bet. With moccasins falling apart, these men stepped ashore and into the hearts of the members who had greeted them. They wished to thank all of those who offered them guns, money, clothes, and all the gear they would have needed to compete in the matches. I just want to make it, if, if anybody comments on this and muzzle blast in the future, just make sure they know I still have my rifle. Oh, I will. I'll make sure they know. That's, that's a key part of the yeah, story uh, there. You were the, you were the smart one tying it down. Yeah, make sure they know. <laughs> I will. Anyway, we go to the trip, tie their rifles in. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a, it was quite a trip, and it was uh, nice to get there, and somebody gave me a, or lent me a dry pair of Wranglers <laughs> jeans, because I'd been wet for about two weeks. I imagine. And then when uh, we got, uh, when I got home, I, draft notice was waiting and i was drafted into the army and spent a year in vietnam oh wow that's a heck of a and, thing to come uh, home to yeah <laughs> well, it was a, i was a combat veteran i was went over in the infantry but i ended up a military policeman i thought i had it made but on two days notice they moved us up by the dmz and my company got 27 amp or yeah 27 ambushes in two and a half months Anyhow, I came back, and I was at one point, I was elected to the Primitive Council. Oh, yeah? I, I think it was the spring shoot after I got back, which would have been spring of 72. Uh, I think people did it because they know I was just back from Vietnam. 
the other two guys that were in the the election runoff was Doc Baker and uh, Phil Blue Jacket Sanders. Okay. And they elected me over those two five <laughs> gentlemen, and I should have abdicated right there and turned it over to Doc, but it was the biggest honor I never had given to me. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, so it was uh, quite a trip, but I'm just thinking back now, 50 years ago today, and I just had to call somebody and talk about it. I was always fascinated with flint locks and stuff since I was a member clear back in the 1960s, and then actually my dad bought me my life membership in 1971 and sent it to me in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm still getting the magazine <laughs> well good We're, i'm happy to hear that I, i'm um i i don't know what to say i mean this i really appreciate you sharing this with me and and thank you for your service and thank you for being a member i mean this is just it's really put well, the the icing on the cake of my week this was wonderful this week we'd like to thank our sponsor jim chambers flintlocks limited jim and his daughter barbie have helped outfit Muzzle loader builders for over 50 years now. Um, if you didn't know, Chambers are the original makers of the Siler locks. They have 22 historically accurate lock styles available. Not to mention their hand-tuned locks and hardware are legendary for their performance and reliability. If you're interested in building a Jim Chambers kit or picking out a rifle or pistol from Jim Chambers Limited, be sure to visit flintlocks.com or call 828 828- Six six seven eight three six one. If you'd like to check out the rest of our Muzzle Blast advertisers, you can visit nmlarray.org slash advertisers to see a full list, visit their websites, and see what they're offering. It's a great way to outfit your next trek or begin shopping for your next project. If you're looking to join us for some camping or some shooting, check out nmlarray.org slash events for a full list and official coverage on NMLRA events. If it's not mentioned that it's canceled or anything has changed on the NMLRA website, nmlra.org, then it hasn't been changed. Um, there are a lot of rumors going around about the events this year with COVID-19, but we want to let you know that you can always check nmlra.org for up-to-date and official information as far as how the association is handling this pandemic. With things opening up, we've had a great opportunity to get some more videos out. If you haven't checked out the NMLRA YouTube channel, you can check out nmlra.org slash video. And this will take you to our official YouTube channel. We're uploading at least a couple videos a month right now as things are opening up. It's giving us a great opportunity to go out and film with people. So be sure to subscribe today and don't miss a video. We'd like to thank the membership of the NMLRA. Without them and their love of living history and muzzleloading, traditional craft as well, we couldn't do any of this that we do here. If you're interested in supporting what we do here or subscribing to Muzzle Blast, you can go to nmlra.org for more information. Your membership includes at least a yearly subscription to Muzzle Blast magazine, but with that, you're also getting a digital archive of every Muzzle Blast magazine going back to the late 1930s. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next week.